Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to see everyone uh, back with us. Still have uh, several people to be remembering on our uh, prayer list. Let's continue to remember uh, Mary Martin, Janelle Davis, uh, Kim Inslee, John Carter, uh, Debbie Bentley, uh, the, uh, the graveside service for Susan Condra. This is Luana Carter's sister who uh, passed away. Uh, still being planned. Uh, details to follow on that. Uh, several people are out sick today. Uh, Kathy Marston, as well as uh, Thomas uh, Robertson. Also, uh, continue remembering your prayers. Uh, David Jones, this was an instructor at the Tri-City School of Preaching, uh, diagnosed with an aggressive cancer, uh, going to be uh, taking treatment in Houston, so please remember him and his family uh, in your prayers. In addition, don't forget the, uh, those that are listed in our bulletin. I believe that's it for our uh, prayer list uh, announcements. One uh, new announcement, uh, we will be uh, sorting food uh, before our uh, Wednesday service. Uh, so if you'd like to come an hour early this Wednesday at 6 p.m., uh, we uh, received a, uh, a lot of donated food and we'll be going through that this Wednesday. So if you can help with that, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, the uh, continue to remember the things we mentioned this morning, uh, uh, donations uh, needed for the uh, blessing box, um, appreciative of all the volunteers who helped at the uh, open house that we had uh, yesterday for the Strawberry Festival. Don't forget this uh, Wednesday continues our spring series. We'll have Ray Wilmoth with us. Also, there are several uh, gospel meetings and other events on the calendar uh, east side uh, is having something uh, today at 6 and then through Wednesday starting at 7. That's over in Cleveland. Also, Avondale is having their men's day this coming Saturday from 8 to 1. Uh, if, also, if you're interested in uh, assisting with the church bus, uh, please see uh, John Scarlett. I believe that's all the announcements. Um, Charlie will be uh, leading us in uh, song this afternoon. Um, I will be taking care of the opening prayer uh, Jim will take care of the Lord's Supper if needed, and Jeff will uh, take care of the closing prayer. Thanks. <clears throat> Let's start out tonight, this afternoon with 591, first and last, 591. <clears throat> Got it. Here we go. Five. When I go to the stars, when you are discouraged, thinking how I'm going to stars, count your many blessings and bring them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. First and last, 678. <clears throat> Lord.
Let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you for giving us this day that we can all come together to hear another lesson from your word. We would ask that you would be with each and every one of us as learners. Help us to take the message that is about to be presented and help us to apply it to our lives so that we can be strong examples in the world for you. Help us to not take our responsibility lightly to spread the gospel. Help us to uh, be a good influence on all those we come into contact with through our jobs, our schools, through our, our interactions with people in our community, to our families, just in every way that we come into contact with others. Just help us to be examples to them so that they would want to learn more about you. Help us to always be diligent in our studies so that we can be as effective as we can be to uh, spread your message. We ask that you would please continue to watch over and guide this congregation. We ask that you would be with all those mentioned on our prayer list. We know there are a lot of very serious situations on there. Please be with all those who are sick, battling cancers and other illnesses. Just uh, please uh, be with each person in each and every situation, as well as their families those take, and those taking care of them. We ask that you would uh, be with all those who are traveling and not able to be here today, as well as those who are traveling and are here. Just please help everyone to make it back to their homes safely. We would ask that you would please continue to watch over and guide this congregation. Help us to always do your will and to work as diligently as we can to spread your message into the world. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. If you're using a book tonight or this afternoon, our invitation song at the proper time will be 572. Now, if you'll join me in standing, and we'll sing 815, first and last. 815. <laughs> Good to see all of you back again tonight. Uh, glad that you've come back and uh, glad we've returned to the scriptural order of standing for that song before the sermon. So I'm joking. <laughs> uh, we're going to be uh, wrapping up uh, uh, the series that we've been going through on Sunday nights for, for quite a little while now, uh, looking at uh, several passages that are good uh, to memorize and good to have internalized. Uh, tonight we're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 12 through 13. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most misused and abused passages in the entire Bible. Uh, you so often hear people quote 
Philippians 4.13. Everyone knows that verse, right? You know, everyone knows, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You hear it all the time, and you hear uh, sports uh, players say it after winning the big game, and you hear uh, all sorts of ways in which that verse is used. Uh, but they're often not using it the way it should be used. I think verse 12 is the forgotten passage that, that makes this whole thing make sense. Uh, Philippians 4, 12 through 13. Uh, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's a big difference. You know, what, what Paul is talking about there is not winning a football game. Paul's not talking about uh, the, the uh, you know, the supernatural strength to do something amazing and, you know, physically. And, you know, that, that's what Paul's talking about. What Paul's talking about here is contentment. And that is often the exact opposite in the way we use this passage. We, we never talk about Philippians 14 as, as being content, you know, what you find yourself in. You know, I just lost my job. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That, that's not the sense that we typically uh, use the passage in. Is it breaking out? Okay. You can just grab the lapel if you want. <laughs> there we go. We got it. Uh, woo. All right. Well, brief intermission. <laughs> now we're back. Uh, but we never use it that way. Uh, we it, it talking about uh, being content. So let's uh, let's dive into the context a little bit and uh, let's pull a couple lessons and uh, we'll we'll have the afternoon be yours. Uh, so let's let's look at the context. Uh, when we look at the book of Philippians, uh, we, we sometimes call Philippians uh, the, book of, uh, the book of joy uh, because Paul over and over and over again uses uh, that term joy uh, throughout the book. I think it's very interesting when you look at the situation that the Apostle Paul is in when he writes this, this book. Well, think about who Paul was. Paul was somebody who came from a well-to-do family. Paul had all the advantages you could really be hoping for in life. When you think about who Paul was, think about some of the things he says about himself. Uh, he says, I, I was a Jew of Jews. Uh, you know, I, I was uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. You know, Benjamin was, was the favored child of, of uh, Jacob, uh, of Israel, all the way back uh, in Genesis. Uh, Jacob and Joseph were the favored children uh, Benjamin's, the tribe that Saul came from, the king Saul uh, came from, and, and very likely Paul, Saul, was named after the king Saul. Uh, you know, he was, he was uh, somebody that the tribe was proud to claim as the, one of their own, even despite his, his faults. And, you know, he was a Jew of Jews. You know, he was well-educated. He was uh, educated at the, the feet of Gamaliel, he talks about. Um, and we know Gamaliel, not just from the Bible, but from other historical sources, you know, he was one of the leading rabbis of this time period. He was one of the leading teachers. He was uh, a very well-known biblical scholar. And Paul was one of his students. Uh, so clearly, Paul had, had some education. Uh, Paul was very, very intelligent. Uh, he knew Greek very well. He knew Hebrew very well. Uh, he probably spoke Aramaic as his native language, so there's three languages there. Uh, he's a Roman citizen, so he probably knows some Latin there, so he's very educated in languages. Uh, we see that Paul quotes from uh, various Greek philosophers and, and people like that, and so he's a very well-educated man. Uh, he knows a lot of things, and he's studied a lot of different areas, and and so he's, he comes from a good background uh, among his peers, a, a well-respected tribe. He's well-educated. And, you know, the fact that he's a Roman citizen uh, is a very important fact. Uh, Roman citizenship was, uh, was uh, 
hard to come by uh, if you were not born into it. And what likely probably happened in somewhere along Paul's line is someone in his family probably purchased uh, that Roman citizenship, and that would have been very, very expensive. And so Paul comes from a, a very privileged background. You know, he had a lot of things going for him in his life. And then you think about the turn that happens when he became a Christian. And that's pretty remarkable. Uh, You think about uh, how that life that he enjoyed, of a life of privilege, of being an up-and-comer in the the world of the Jews, that shifted overnight. When he uh, has that encounter with Jesus and he's baptized and, and professes the faith that he was once trying to destroy, think about how all of that changed in his life. Think of how the relationships he had with his family must have changed. Think about how the relationships with his you know, colleagues, his peers, his, his work friends, think about how that must have changed. Think about whether he was welcome in the same areas, in the same places that he was once welcome with, but probably not. He sacrificed a great deal. And you think about uh, where Paul is when he writes this letter. Uh, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 7, uh, he tells us that he's, uh, he's imprisoned. Uh, he says, uh, it's right for you to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for your partakers with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel. And I think verse 12 is really interesting, talking about the kind of attitude Paul has here as he's been going through this imprisonment. Uh, you know, prison is not an enjoyable thing. It's not a good thing to be told what you can do and where you can go. And you know, that, that's not a, a, a pleasant experience. But nevertheless, Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. You know, what, what an incredible attitude that, that even in chains, even while being imprisoned, Paul says, listen, what's happened to me, it's, it's been for the good. You know, all of the things that have occurred and all the sufferings that I've gone through, this has allowed me to advance the gospel. People know about Christ because of the situation that I'm in now. And despite, you know, the unpleasantness of it, people have have come to know God. And that's a, a very admirable kind of attitude. But Paul's been imprisoned here. We know Paul's going to be imprisoned again uh, in uh, the, the pastoral epistles, uh, the letters of 1st, 2nd Timothy. We, Paul talks about his imprisonment, and that imprisonment's going to eventually lead in his death. Uh, from historical accounts, we know Paul's going to be beheaded in Rome. Uh, Paul, in 2nd Corinthians, gives an account for some of the sufferings that he's uh, endured uh, for the cause of Christ. Uh, and as I th- read through this list... Uh, it's, it's just incredible that you can have all of this happen to one person. You know, just, just the amount of time to recover from these beatings would be, would be terrible. And yet Paul endures all of these things, and he keeps going back. He doesn't give up. He's not dissuaded. He, he continues and perseveres. Look at the, some of the things that Paul talks about enduring. He says, you know, far more imprisonments, uh, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews uh, the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Night and day I was drifted to sea. On frequent journeys and dangers of rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from all these things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who's weak and I'm not weak? Who's made to fall and I'm not uh, indignant? You know, Paul says, listen, I have been through the ringer. You know, you want to question my apostleship is kind of the question, uh, the things that are going on in 2 Corinthians. But he says, listen, I have suffered for Christ. I have really suffered. You know, I've been beaten, shipwrecked. Can, can you even imagine being adrift at sea uh, overnight? You know, that's, I, I don't like deep water. That's the worst thing I can imagine. <laughs> you know, that's, that is awful. Uh, and the beatings and stonings. Think about how brutal a stoning would be. 
You know, just to pick up, when we went to Israel, there's rocks everywhere. You know, it's a very, uh, certain areas of Israel are very dusty, dirt, uh, full of, uh, you know, just big, big chunks of rock just laying on the ground everywhere. Just imagine picking up rocks and throwing them at somebody until they die. That's a, that's a terrible, terrible thing to go through. And they thought Paul was dead. He was left for dead, and he survived, but... He wasn't dissuaded. He was beaten with rods, shipwrecked multiple occasions. Uh, Paul has suffered. And yet, despite this suffering, Paul says, listen, I know the secret to facing plenty. I know the secret to facing hunger. I know when things are good. I know when things are bad. I know how to get through it. And the secret to it is, and he says, you know, this is a secret. Don't tell anybody. The secret is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What, a, what an incredible attitude. And what an incredible way to, to speak about, you know, the, the strength that God gives. Uh, Paul has been through so much. And he says, in whatever situation, I can be content you know, whatever situation, if I find myself in a, a time of plenty where there's plenty to eat and things are comfortable and I have a bed to sleep in, I, I can serve God and do what's right because I know Christ. If, if I'm struggling and I'm hungry and, and I'm lacking clothes and I'm exposed to the cold or the hot or whatever it might, I, I can be content because I know Christ. And so when he talks about this, I, I think... Contentment is, is so important, and it's so difficult. You know, contentment is not a natural thing. Uh, you know, contentment does not come naturally to most people. It is, it is a hard thing to learn. It, it is a learned behavior. Uh, the psalmist, uh, or in Proverbs uh, chapter 30, uh, you have one of my favorite Proverbs. Uh, and, and it's a proverb that is really difficult to genuinely live out. Uh, and to say for yourself, uh, he says, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is necessary for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. You know, imagine saying this and, and you know, Praying this as a, as a prayer, you know, Lord, give me what I need and don't give me anything else. You know, d- don't make me rich, you know, because if I'm rich, I might be tempted to say, well, who is the Lord? I might be tempted to forget the God who has given me all these blessings and, and to take pride in my own actions and to, to go off on my own way. But also, don't, don't, give me so, don't, don't let me be uh, impoverished so that I might, might steal and profane the name of God, so that I might go against your covenant and be, be tempted to break your laws. You know, give me just what I need. And often I think we confuse needs for wants. And we have so many wants that have been fulfilled in our life that, that we really struggle to identify what our real needs are. The things that we need are enough food for the day. The, the, the rest is all wants. But to be able to say that is is truly a difficult thing. It's truly difficult to be content and to to reach a point where you're satisfied and say, don't give me any more. Don't make me be rich. Don't uh, don't let me be poor. It's difficult because we, we want more. We have a natural tendency towards greed. We want to be continually have uh, what we have grow and increase and, and have bigger and better things, better items, better cars, better phones, and you know, a, a fatter bank account. And there's this constant urge, this constant desire that, that pushes so many for, for more and more and more material things. And that's a hard cycle to break out of. It's hard to, to get out of the habit of trying to keep up with the Joneses, and it's hard to, to go through that kind of thing. It's also hard to, to put away selfishness, to put away ambition. This is what he talks about here in this proverb. You know, don't let me be full and deny you and say, well, who is the Lord? 
The tendency is when we do very well to say, well, I earned this myself. I got here by my own merit, my own strength, and the own, my, own, my own effort. And so, well, who is the Lord? How has he helped me get there? I achieved this by myself. That's a, a very real temptation. And, and you see it all the time in people, don't you? You know, people who may come from very, very humble backgrounds and have done very well for themselves in their life, and as they, they do well and they, they grow and, you know, are, are very successful, there's a, 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 uh, a departure from who they once were, and there's some pride that begins to creep in, and there's this uh, selfish ambition is what James talks about, uh, you know, Recognition is not necessarily a bad thing, but it can be. It can be very detrimental to your soul. We as a church ought to recognize people when they do good things and celebrate with them when they they accomplish good things and, and rejoice with them. We talked a little bit about that this morning. That's a good thing. You know, having uh, positions of power is not inherently a bad thing. You know, God has entrusted the elders with authority, with, with uh, you know, some, uh, a measure of power over the congregation. That, that's not a bad thing. But when you begin to crave power for power's sake, and you begin to crave recognition and, and for, for the sake of recognition, then you have a recipe for trouble. When you begin to uh, say, well, well, who is the Lord? You fall into the same trap that Pharaoh fell into all the way back uh, in Exodus when we talked about that. You know, well, well, who is the Lord that I should follow him? You know, that's, that's a dangerous place to be. And so we need to learn to be content and deny those things. Deny greed and deny selfishness, deny ambition, deny pride. There's a, a, a riddle that you may have heard once upon a time. Uh, well, it's, uh, it goes uh, along like this. Uh, what do the poor have, the rich need, and if you eat it, you die? Well, the answer is nothing. Uh, and, you know, that's a, a hard, hard message. You know, it, it is hard to, for, to tell the poor, uh, be content. It's hard to tell the rich, be content. Uh, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we, we need some contentment. And it's a hard lesson to learn. Contentment is not, however, uh, complacency. That's as natural. Well, I, I forgot to change it, but contentment is not complacency. And, and I think that's, that's an important message as well. Um, what is contentment? Uh, contentment is the, 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 a, a proper alignment of priorities. It, it's to say that I know that what I have is good, that what God has given me is, is sufficient for me. That these material possessions that I could be pursuing after in my life are, are ultimately meaningless. They're fleeting. Ultimately, they, they amount to very little, nothing, and because they will pass away. And so contentment says, you know, my priorities need to be what's on, on what's permanent and what's lasting, on, on spiritual things that are of true substance and significance. Complacency is, is not the same. Complacency be, is, is the acceptance of, of mediocrity. It's, it's being comfortable where you're at and, and refusing to, to advance any further. And, and that's an issue. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, Paul is writing here and he says, uh, Let's not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let's do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So what you hear, see here is, is a, a drive. Paul says, don't, don't be complacent. Don't, don't grow weary in doing good. Continue to strive and, and work to do good at, at every opportunity that's available to you. Complacency is, a, is an issue that will kill churches. Churches that grow complacent and grow apathetic are churches that are, are struggling. And it has always been that way. You look back in Revelation and you see uh, the, the, the message that's given to the church uh, at Sardis that you know, you're, you're neither hot nor cold. Now, I wish that you just make up your mind and be, be hot or be cold, but, but you're this lukewarm and it's disgusting and I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. 
You know, there's an issue of complacency. Christians should be content in the situation they have in life, but they shouldn't become complacent with their spiritual growth. You can't be complacent in your service to God. We must always be striving to to be better each day. We must always be striving to to find new ways to serve God and to grow in righteousness, to continue to do what's right, do good works. Uh, Don't uh, grow complacent uh, in doing good. So the time we have left, uh, let's look at this. How do we become content? You know, that's the question. Paul here is talking about, about being content. Paul has, has figured this out. Uh, he has figured out how to, in times of, of great suffering, times of great abundance, uh, times of plenty, times of wanting, he's figured out the secret, and he tells you the secret. The secret is verse 13. The secret to facing times of great uh, abundance and great poverty is that Christ strengthens him through it. You know, what an incredible thing to say. Uh, that uh, what, what an incredible perspective. And I think that's what this really boils down to. Is that contentment is largely a perspective to have in, in life. There will always be more you can have. You will never, if, if pursuing after worldly possessions is the, the driving force in your life, you will never be content. You see this all the time. I like to occasionally listen to the Dave Ramsey show. I don't know if you, any of you ever listen to it. Um, but uh, one of the things uh, he'll, he'll talk to is he'll talk to somebody that, that has kind of followed through his steps and has become very wealthy, uh, and, and they have a common problem. They, they have spent a long time striving after, you know, becoming uh, wealthy and strived after, uh, you know, becoming financially stable and dependent. And they realize that you, they come to a point where money has lost its meaning. And the money that they have, they've, they've gotten so much that now they, they don't care about it. And they, they begin to lose purpose and drive. Or on the flip side, there's, they achieve all that they've ever achieved and, and they're, they're feeling empty because what do I do now? I, I need something else to strive after and, and they're, not, they're not satisfied. They, they achieve the goal that they've worked towards for so long, but it's not enough and it doesn't provide them the fulfillment that they think it's going to provide. And, and, you know, money doesn't buy happiness. That, that's a very true statement. And so... Having a godly perspective, having the proper perspective is, is to realize and to understand that materialism is not going to make me happy. Having things is not going to satisfy me. You know, having those times of plenty, it, it means nothing because there's going to become times of, of wanting. And so whatever situation, if you want to be truly content... Your contentment does not come from the circumstances you find yourself in. Your contentment comes from Christ. Your contentment comes from knowing that, uh, recognizing the blessings that God has given you. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Luke chapter 1, when Mary finds out that she's going to be the one to give birth to the Christ, uh, that she's going to be the one to to, uh, give birth to Jesus. Uh, you have this section that's uh, sometimes called the Magnificat, and we sometimes sing that song, uh, Magnificat. Uh, it, it means, uh, you know, uh, glorifying God, essentially. Uh, and Mary sings this song on her, her way back as she, she has learned this great blessing that she's about to receive. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he's looked down on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. You know, this recognition of God has blessed me in an incredible way. You know, despite my humble estate, God has seen fit to bless me in, in this capacity. Notice she's not complaining about her humble estate. You know, she's not complaining about, about being just a, you know, a, a poor Jewish girl in, in this time period. 
she was likely not very wealthy by the standards of, uh, certainly not by the standards of living today, uh, probably not even by the standards of her day. Uh, but yet, despite her humble estate, God has blessed her. She doesn't say, you know, give me, give me more, give me riches. You know, let me, let me have a comfortable life. If I'm going to take care of uh, the, the child, the, the Christ, the Messiah that's been prophesied about so long, well, here's my laundry list of things that I need. I need a, a nice house where everyone can have their own bedroom, and I need this and that. And uh, that's not what she does. She's, she's content with what she has. And she thanks God for the blessings he has given her. She's not focused on the blessings he hasn't given her. And that's the difference. That's the, 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 the contentment type of attitude. That's the contentment perspective. It's whatever situation, if I'm, if I'm doing well for myself and God has blessed me immeasurably, and for most of us, that's the situation we find ourselves in. God has given us more than we could possibly need. We can find contentment in God because these possessions that we have are really ultimately very meaningless. They're going to fade away. You know, for those who, who are lacking, one of the great things about uh, the, the school that I've, I've had the privilege to go through it through Freed is uh, we'll often have uh, students from uh, Kenya or students from Uganda and students from various places in Africa that, that are, live in really difficult situations and some severe poverty situations. Uh, one of the, the students that uh, I became friends with, uh, his, Luke, his name is uh, Luke Apamaku. Uh, he's, he's a great guy, and uh, he, he preaches over in Uganda, and he lives over there. And uh, he lives in a, a hut, uh, a little hut with his uh, family and his nine children. Uh, and uh, he, nine children, he's one year older than me. And I said, Luke, man, I, I don't know how you have time in your day to, to keep up with all those kids. Uh, but, you know, despite the, the challenging circumstances that he's in, you know, feeding nine mouths, they're very content. You know, he, he never talks about the things that he doesn't have, and he's, not, he's never talking about the, the blessings that he wishes he has. He's thankful for the blessings that he does have. And he's thankful for the way that God has provided. And so somebody who has a great deal more than they need, you can be content in knowing that Christ uh, has provided what you truly need, which is salvation. And for those who, who have very little on earth and may have very humble estates, you can find contentment in realizing that God has provided for you what you truly need, salvation. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, slave or free, male or female, right? Uh, for you're all one in Christ. And so as we uh, wrap up this whole series that we've been looking at, uh, this Learn to Remember series, I hope that you've taken these verses and you've kind of uh, worked along and, and, you know, even if you haven't committed them verbatim to memory, I hope that you remember these passages and, and remember them well because they're all important. Uh, Philippians 4.13 is a great verse. Uh, you know, it, it's a verse that I'm glad a lot of people have known and committed to memory but don't remember verse 13 without verse 12. Uh, the verse is about commitment or contentment. Uh, whatever situation you find yourself in, be content and know that God has given you what you truly need above all else, uh, his son. So this afternoon, if you need to put Christ on in baptism, uh, let me encourage you to do that. Uh, maybe you are a Christian, but you've not been who you need to be, and you need to seek the prayers of forgiveness and seek the prayers of the church. Uh, let me encourage you to do that as well. If we can do anything for you, let me encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing.